Hi, I am Errol Suarez and welcome to our report on the cement industry. Angel and Sheta and I will be discussing the raw materials used and the production itself of dry process, ordinary Portland cement, as well as factors influencing production, the hazards in the cement industry, and cement in the Philippine setting. But before we delve into the details, we must first ask, what is cement? Cement is commonly defined as a material which binds together solid aggregate by hardening from a plastic state. Plastic, as in capable of being molded into a desired shape. This material is often in the form of a powdery substance, stored in bags such as the one we see here. Concrete, another common term, is what we should instead call cement that has already been mixed with water and aggregate such as sand. A pure mixture of cement and water is usually called neat paste. Using neat paste is not often favored not only due to its cost, but also due to it producing more heat and being more sensitive to volume changes once it has already hardened. Noticeably, this common definition of cement is quite general and tells us nothing about its chemical properties. This could be due to the differences in the two types of cement, hydraulic and non-hydraulic. Cement is hydraulic if it sets due to the reaction with water. Non-hydraulic cement is often still mixed with water, but the water is not what is causing it to set. But regardless, for both of these types, the first step in production is calcination. Here, limestone, CaCO3, is burned at 800 to 900 degrees Celsius to produce quicklime, CaO, and CO2. In production, calcium carbonate does not appear like what we see here, but is instead crushed into a fine white powder. In fact, most of the calcium-based compounds in cement production are in the form of a white powdery substance. The difference between the two types of cement lies in what happens to the quicklime, or CaO. In the production of non-hydraulic cement, quicklime is already reacted with water to produce slaked lime, or calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is also a white powdery substance but is slightly soluble in water. Non-hydraulic cement sets when the slaked lime reacts with carbon dioxide in the air producing calcium carbonate and more water in an exothermic reaction. Since calcium carbonate is insoluble in water, the cement tries by allowing the water to evaporate. Most cement used today is hydraulic, and one of those is Portland cement, which we will be focusing on in this report. In the production of hydraulic cement, quicklime is reacted with aggregates like sand, which contain silica, alumina, and iron oxide. These form clinkers, which are ground into cement. One of these clinkers is tricalcium silicate, or alite, from silica and quicklime. The hydraulic cement sets when the compounds like alite are mixed and reacted with water, forming hydrates and calcium hydroxide in an exothermic reaction. Looking at this reaction gives us plenty of information. The amount of heat formed explains why aggregate is often added to cement. For reference, in the reaction shown, the hydration of 1 kg of pure alite can heat 1 liter of water by about 90 Celsius degrees. The reaction also explains why hydraulic cement sets so much faster than non-hydraulic cement. Water is used up in the reaction instead of being formed as a product. The reaction also tells us why water is said to strengthen hydraulic cement, but only until a certain point. Additional water can help convert unreacted compounds like alite to become harder and stronger hydrates, but water in excess can no longer do that and may only negatively affect the cement's crystal structure. Cement is such a good strength contributing material that it is commonly seen in many structures today. Its strength and ease of use allow cement to be used in concrete roads and footpaths. Its ability to set as well as compressive strength allows it to be used in tall buildings, support for roofs, stairs, and tunnels. The ability of hydraulic cement to resist water also allows it to be used in dams and wells. Also, aside from its applications as concrete, cement itself as an adhesive has many other uses, like in joints for pipes and drains. Cement is an old invention of mankind as its history can be traced as early as 7000 BC in Yefta Helgali as a binder for floorings. It was made from calcined limestone which was mixed with water and was non-hydraulic. In 1950 BC, the Egyptians first recorded the process of making concrete from gypsum. Although limestone is abundant in the Nile River, gypsum can readily be burned at 170 to 200 degrees Celsius to form 
form a cement-like substance. However, these cements were water-soluble. Eventually, the Egyptians made artificial bricks from the said materials, which was called fashions. One example of the structure they built using the said material are the pyramids of Giza. At 500 BC, the Greeks added volcanic ash in their process of making cement. The said volcanic ash was harvested from the island of Terra. Because of the addition of volcanic ash, the resulting cement became water-resistant and was made suitable for making cisterns or places to store water. An example of these structures is found in Camiros on the island of Rhodes. The Romans further improved the invention of the Greeks. So, at 75 BC, the first use of hydraulic cement was found in Roman architecture, where they used the volcanic ash as a source of silicon oxide. The best materials for making cement during that era was found in Pozzoli, Italy, so the reaction of adding cement to water was called pozzolanic. This cement was called Opus Cementitium, or literally good cement, and was documented by Vitruvius in 25 BC. The next improvement in cement is found in England, where John Smeaton repairs the Edistone Lighthouse in 1756 using water, lime, ironstone, and pozzolans. It was the first documented use of ironstone in cement making. The next major improvement in cement came from the Aspidins. Joseph Aspidin passed then Portland cement in 1824, while his son William Aspidin improves the formula of Portland cement in 1841. It was called Portland cement because they claimed that once the cement hardens, it would be as good as the quarried stones in Portland. However, Joseph Aspidin's recipe did not work. Portland cement would not be perfected until 1845 by Isaac Charles Johnson. The top cement producers in 2019 are China with 2,200 metric tons made, followed by India which has 320, followed by Vietnam with 95, followed by the United States with 89, and finally Egypt with 76. If sorted by company, the capacity of some top cement producers in million metric tons are 367 for Lafarge Halsim, 187.3 for Heidelberg Cement, 91 for Semex, 74.1 for CRH, and 70.8 for Ultratech Cement. The current trend of cement production is upwards due to the increasing demand for cement in public works and housings. According to ALSOP, at 2020, we are expecting a consumption of 4,175 million metric tons. Once again, this report will be focusing on dry process ordinary Portland cement. We will be discussing dry process later in unit operations. The definition of Portland cement in Shreve's Chemical Process Industries focuses on hydraulic calcium silicates, as well as the addition of gypsum or calcium sulfate. Specifically, these are dicalcium and tricalcium silicates. Portland in the name is from the resemblance of Portland cement, shown in the block on the left, with Portland stone, shown in the wall on the right. Portland stone is limestone specifically quarried from the Isle of Portland in England. Portland cement does not have the specification. The ordinary in ordinary Portland cement refers to it not being blended, in contrast to common blended variants such as Pozzolanic Portland cement. To be able to better understand Portland cement, we must first identify the imported compounds formed near the reactions. Tricalcium silicate is often referred to as A light, and dicalcium silicate is referred to as B light. Tricalcium aluminate and tetracalcium aluminoferrite are the other two important clinkers. Notice that Portland cement is mostly calcium silicate, so the materials in production of Portland cement are classified as calcareous or argillaceous. Calcareous materials provide calcium, like with limestone, chalk, and marl. On the other hand, argillaceous materials provide silica, like with clay and shale. Let us now go to the classifications of Portland cement. Portland cement is classified based on its adherence to prescribed concentrations, and these will be discussed later. For now, Kean cement describes type 1 as a type used for general construction. Type 2 is used for concrete constantly in contact with soil or groundwater as well as heavy structures. 
type 3 has high early strength due to higher alite proportions, meaning structures can be used earlier. Type 4 is a low heat portland cement due to lower tricalcium aluminate and alite proportions, so it compensates for strength with tetracalcium alumina ferrite. Type 5 is the least expansive, so it is used for constructions constantly exposed to ground or sea water. The primary raw materials of cement include limestone, marl, clay, sand, and shale. However, due to environmental or economic reasons, substitutes like fly ash and slags are used. The important thing in choosing raw materials is the proximity of the source from the manufacturing plant and that the minimum requirements should be met by the materials used. The major ingredient of cement is limestone. It is the main source of calcium carbonate and has traces of silicon oxide, aluminum oxide, and ferrous oxide. It comes from a sedimentary rock made from the hard parts of dead organisms and is the most common sedimentary rock. It is composed of at least 90% calcium carbonate and may contain impurities which will have an impact on the final product. Powdered limestone is also added at the end of the process to reduce the total emissions per bag of cement. Marl contains silicon oxide, calcium carbonate, and ferrous oxide. It is a sedimentary rock created from the compaction of limestone and clay and is composed of 40-75% to 75 calcium carbonate. Clay and shale contribute silicon oxide, aluminum oxide, and ferrous oxide. Clay is a weathered-down igneous rock, while shale is a compressed clay. Clay may have sulfur impurities, which will have an impact on emission. If the silica present in this material is big enough, less sand is needed in the raw material. If the silicon oxide in the previous raw materials is not enough, the producers would add quartz sand. This sand is harvested from beaches and is usually white unless it has impurities. It is at least 95% silicon oxide. Fly ash or PFA is an eco-friendly substitute to clay and shale. It mainly contributes silicon oxide, aluminum oxide, and ferrous oxide. It comes from the residue recovered from the combustion of fuel in the burning of coal. On the other hand, slag or blast furnace slag contributes calcium oxide and ferrous oxide, which makes it a suitable alternative for limestone. Because it was already heated in a previous process, the calcium carbonate in it was already turned into quicklime. Slag is a byproduct in iron and steel manufacture and is typically 40% calcium oxide. Gypsum is added after grinding the clinkers. It is composed of calcium sulfate and water and is used to increase the setting time of cement. A sample mix of raw materials is shown below. It can be seen that the main ingredient in cement is limestone with 78% the dry basis, followed by clay with 17% and sand with 4%. So that we can visualize the production of cement and see it in action, here is the How It's Made episode about cement. Kindly pause this video and click the link on screen or in the video description, and come back here when you're done. Before we go into detail with the unit processes and unit operations in this production, let's first take a quick glance at our block flow diagram. Calcareous material such as limestone clay and argillaceous material enter a crusher and mixer. The raw meal then enters a preheater which is connected to a calciner. These are where the calcination reaction happens. The calcium carbonate is converted into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. So, the hot meal contains quicklime, unreacted calcium carbonate, alumina, silica, and iron oxide. The carbon dioxide gas from calcination does not fully leave as excess gases, and some also enter the kiln. The kiln is where the other four reactions happen. Quicklime reacts with alumina to form the calcium aluminate, some of the quicklime reacts with silica in a way forming B-Lite, while some of the quicklime react with silica forming A-Lite. Lastly, quicklime reacts with alumina and iron oxide forming tetracalcium aluminoferrite. The hot air from the kiln, including the carbon dioxide formed in calcination, is recycled back to the preheat to carry heat. From there, exhaust gases, mostly containing carbon dioxide, are expelled to the atmosphere. The clinkers, namely intercalcium aluminate, B-lite, A-lite, and tetracalcium aluminoferrite are fed into the ball meal. The unreacted calcium carbonate 
as well as the unreacted calcium oxide or free lime are also fed to the ball mill. From there, gypsum and more limestone dust is added. The ball mill then crushes these materials forming cement powder. Cement chemistry often uses abbreviations or cement chemistry shorthand. Calcium oxide or quicklime is often referred to simply as C, alumina as A, silica as S, iron oxide as F. So, tricalcium silicate or A light is called C3S, dicalcium silicate or B light is called C2S, and so on. Let us now go to the unit processes, the first of which is preheating. Here, the raw meal is heated to about 800 degrees Celsius before entering the calciner. This is done in order to save energy. This is considered a unit process since clay minerals decompose here as well as dolomite. Any present water is also made to evaporate here. This is particularly important for wet process cement. Lastly, since limestone is a sedimentary rock, some organic matter may be present. This organic matter is also broken down the preheater. The product may contain hydrocarbons, but some of these can combust into CO and CO2. The possibility of harmful carbon monoxide gas being formed results in the regulation of organic matter and CO emissions. Preheating is usually done in either a suspension preheater or a precalciner kiln. A suspension preheater functions like a tower of successive heat exchangers. Heat is transferred from gases leaving the kiln at 1000 degrees Celsius to the entering raw meal. This is regulated so that the raw meal is heated to about 800 degrees Celsius. A pre calciner kiln is a second separate kiln where fuel is burnt. The heat produced here, as well as the extra heat from the succeeding calciner, raised the temperature of the raw meal to about 850 degrees Celsius. The figure shown does not necessarily describe the appearance of a pre calciner kiln, but it describes the general principle where another flame source is what heats the raw meal. The next unit process is calcination. Calcination, as previously discussed, is the decomposition of calcium carbonate. This reaction is done at a temperature of 800 to 900 degrees Celsius and is highly endothermic. Calcination occurs at both the preheaters and calciner. Raw meal leaving the preheaters, also known as hot meal, may already have a degree of calcination as high as 50%. The calciner is like a vertical furnace where this calcination is completed realistically until 95-97%. to 97%. The third and final unit process is aggregate binding or tinkering. The aggregate, or the materials containing silica, alumina, and iron oxide, react with the quick lime to produce clinkers about 3 to 20 millimeters in size. While these reactions are supposed to happen at the kiln, some quick lime and silica react early in the calciner forming some b -light. This happens since the production of beelite exceeds at 800 to 900 degrees Celsius, like calcination. However, the early production of beelite does not happen in significant amounts and only if the fed calcium carbonate and silicon oxides are fine enough and well mixed before the process. The figure shows that the early production of beelite can happen not only in the calciner but also in the preheater. These are the two structures on the left. Since the other three aggregate binding reactions proceed at much higher temperatures, these are done in a rotary kiln. A rotary kiln is like a constantly rotating furnace lined by refractory bricks and a steel shell. The temperature inside the kiln is uneven and is mostly concentrated near the flame and the top of the kiln. The form clinkers often exit right below the flame source and the exhaust gases leave next to the entering feet as they go back to the preheater. Here, tetracalcium aluminoferrite and alite are formed at 900 to 1300 degrees Celsius. Tricalcium aluminate is formed above 1,300 degrees Celsius. The temperature is controlled so that despite the uneven areas, enough alite is produced with respect to b light. While both are products from the reaction of calcium oxide and silica, they contribute different characteristics to the final cement product, likely due to differences in crystal shape, as shown in the figure. There are four main unit operations in cement, that is, crushing, mixing, cooling, and grinding. Crushing is done to prepare the feed. The raw materials are first subjected to crushers which could be hammer crushers or impact crushers. For best result, the particle size of calcium carbonate should be less than 125 micrometers and less than 45 micrometers for silica quartz before being fed to the calciner. However, because grinding quartz is hard, 
the raw meal just passes through a 90 micrometer sieve before being fed to a mixer. Because of this, the feed must have a very small amount of water or the screen might get blocked. A word of caution though, powdered quartz is a significant health hazard as it can cause silicosis. After the feed is crushed, it is then homogenized. Using the wet process or the dry process, the wet process uses a wash mill or ball mill with dryers, and the expected output is a slurry composed of 35-50% to 50% water. However, the total fuel consumption of this process is high as it needs to be dried before going to the preheaters. However, the equipment needed for this kind of process is relatively cheap. On the other hand, the dry process uses pneumatic or air blenders, and the expected output is a dry kiln feed. The total fuel consumption is low compared to the wet process. However, the equipment used in dry process are more expensive. After passing through the kiln, the clinker is then cooled rapidly to prevent the formation of big bellite crystals, which affects allite formation. To do this, cool air is blown to the clinkers. Heat is then absorbed by the cool air and is then recycled to the preheaters. It takes about 2 to 3 meters cube cooling air to cool 1 kilogram clinker to 100 degrees Celsius. The N there stands for normal condition. Gypsum and free lime are then added at the end of the cooling process. After the clinker is cooled, it passes through a grinder which could be a ball, hammer, roller, or vertical mill, where the clinker is crushed into powder. Since ball mills are the most prevalent, ball mills will be discussed. Ball mills usually have several chambers which differ in the ranges of balls in the chamber. Once the clinker is ground to a certain size, it drops through the bottom grate and moves to the next area. Some factors that can affect clinker grinding include excess bell light and high LSF. This makes the clinker harder to grind. On the other hand, high amounts of KO2, a compound in clays and fly ash, make the final clinker easier to grind. Now that we have discussed more of the details in the production of dry processed Portland cement, let us now look at the process flow diagram. Calcareous material and argillaceous material are subjected to V101, a hammer crusher. This produces a raw meal which is then sent to V102, a pneumatic mixer. After which, the raw meal enters T101, a suspension preheater, as well as gases coming from H102, a rotary kiln. Here, some minor decompositions happen as well as some decalcination. The hot meal then goes to H101, the calciner, finishing the calcination. Exhaust gases, mostly carbon dioxide from calcination, are vented to the atmosphere. The calcined hot meal, as well as some hot gases, now enter H102, the road kiln, where the clinkers, namely A light, B light, tricalcium aluminate, and tetracalcium aluminoferrite, are produced. The clinkers, as well as some unreacted calcium oxide, now known as free lime, and unreacted calcium carbonate, are immediately cooled by air in E101. Some of the warm air from E101 is also carried back to the preheater. Finally, gypsum and limestone powder are added and crushed alongside the clinkers in V103, a ball mill, where the ordinary Portland cement is taken as a product. Cement production is governed by several factors. Each compound contributes to the properties of the cement produced. The exact composition can be computed using the Bogues formula, which is dependent on the alumina ratio. The percentage composition of the different types of Portland cement are tabulated below. Other factors that affect final product quality include the lime saturation factor or LSF, silica and alumina modulus, particle size distribution, and the impurities of the feed, clinker heating and cooling, and the cement composition. LSF or lime saturation factor determines the ratio of limestone to other materials. The raw limestone should ideally have a 2.0 lime saturation factor, otherwise the proportion of other materials have to be adjusted. When clinker LSF is 1.0, the proportion of allite, the principal strength giving calcium silicate, is maximized. Typical LSF level of the final product is 94-98% to 98% because of the gypsum added at the end of the process. If the LSF is higher than 100%, free lime was added to the product. Silica and alumina ratio or modulus 
affects the setting time of cement. The standard alumina ratio is 1.5 to 1.8 and if the alumina ratio is higher than prescribed, the final strength of the resulting concrete decreases, but the early strength of the resulting concrete increases. On the other hand, the standard silica ratio is 2.4 to 2.6. If the silica ratio is higher than prescribed, the strength of the resulting concrete generally increases. However, high silica ratios can reduce the burnability of the feed. Particle size distribution and impurities can also affect the quality of the final product. Some examples include coarse quartz in the raw meal can reduce the burnability because belite plus reform around the quartz grains which reduce the conversion of belite to allite. Another example could be if the sulfur to alkali ratio of the feed is too high, the feed can cause buildups in of sulfur in the preheater. Fortunately, this can be resolved by adding more free lime. Another example could be the presence of some impurities which could improve the early strength gain of concrete. Lastly, coarser cement increases the setting time of concrete. Another factor that can affect the final product's quality is the clinker heating and cooling time. For example, heating raw materials in reduced atmosphere or oxygen makes the resulting alight unstable, which leads to less alight in the final product. This also happens if there is a big quantity of sulfate in the kiln feed. Another example could be heating the feed longer causes the alight and the light crystals to grow larger. On the other hand, cooling clinkers must be done in a timely fashion because hot clinkers can adversely affect the ball mill grinders. And because long periods of hot but not so hot temperature can promote the decay of allite to bellite and free lime, which affects the final strength of concrete. Lastly, it is because the heat can be recycled back to the preheaters. Cement composition also affects the cement quality. For example, C2S or bellite is responsible for the final strength, while C3S or allite is responsible for early strength gain and final strength. C3A causes set but needs retardation using gypsum. It is also partially responsible for early strength gain. C4AF reduces the clinker cooking temp but does not contribute much to the final concrete strength. Calcium oxide improves the compressive strength of cement. However, up to 2.5% calcium oxide by weight can only be added before it negatively affects the said property. Lastly, gypsum increases the setting time of the resulting cement, making it workable for longer periods of time. Let us now have a recap on the process conditions. Calcination and the production of B light proceed at 800 to 900 degrees Celsius. The production of A light and tetracalcium alumina ferrite proceed at 900 to 1300 degrees Celsius. The production of tricalcium alumina proceeds above 1300 degrees Celsius. As shown in the figure, different stages of, of a preheater have different temperatures and pressures. Gases from are maintained to enter at 1000 degrees Celsius, so the temperatures range from 300 to 1000 degrees C and the pressures from 360 to 5,000 pascals. The calciner is maintained at about 900 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, since the heat in kilns is uneven, the temperature near the burning zone is maintained at 1,500 degrees Celsius, while the temperature near the end, where it is recycled to the preheater, is maintained at 1,000 degrees Celsius. The Cement Plant Operations Handbook for Dry Process Plants by ASOP in 2019 also provides this table for the temperatures needed in the reactions in a kiln. Although cement is a useful material, it also poses several hazards to us and the environment. For example, the carbon dioxide production of cement contributes about 8% of annual anthropogenic global carbon dioxide production because calcination and fuel burning reduces carbon dioxide. Other hazards include limestone mining and the other emissions of cement production. Limestone is easy to locate and extract. It poses several hazards for the miners and the community near the mining site. For miners, free crystalline silica that is released into the atmosphere during quarrying can cause silicosis, which scars the lungs. Another hazard is the extreme heat in mines. As the temperature of the rock goes up to about 1 degree Celsius for every 100 meter in depth, 
For the community, water quality might degrade in the presence of mining sites as water found in quarries are brought upstream. Furthermore, as water and limestone from quarries are removed, the top of underground quarries can become more vulnerable to collapse. This phenomena creates sinkholes as shown in right. Cement manufacturers also produce other emissions which include SOX, NOX, and COX. SOX or sulfur oxides comes from dark-colored limestones and pyrite in clays. They can be removed by adding hydrated lime to the kiln. However, if released, it can cause acid rain and it inhibits plant growth. On the other hand, the NOx or nitrous oxides come from organic materials found in the fuel used in burning and causes acid rain and haze. Cox or carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide comes from incomplete or complete combustion of fuel. Carbon monoxide emissions can be reduced by ensuring that fuel is dry before burning or by improving the fuel and air mixing. When released into the atmosphere, it can cause acid rain. While the Philippines is nowhere near the top countries in cement production, it is not reliant on importing cement as there are many cement companies here. The most notable brands in terms of production in 2019 are Wholesome, Republic, Eagle, and Semex. Many Philippine cement companies can do their own limestone querying with local plants for clinker production and cement grinding. Three top international cement companies have plants here in the Philippines, namely Semex, CRH, and Lafarge Wholesome. Now owned by San Miguel, Wholesome has plants in La Union, Bulacan, Samis Oriental, and Davao. Samex produces Apoch cement in Cebu and Rizal or formerly solid cement in Rizal. CRH produces Republic cement in Bulacan, Batangas, and Cebu. The Philippines also boasts many local cement companies, such as Big Boss Cement with a plant in Pampanga, Eagle Cement in Bulacan, Goodfound Cement in Albay, Finma Cement in Bataan, and Northern Cement in Pangasinan. And that concludes our report on the cement industry. Thank you for watching. The references are also in the description of the video.